Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Hey, Dev, what's going on? What's going on? Nothing much. About to head out of Tennessee and head to New York for a conference. So, hey, yep. So it's coming to my neck of the woods. Yep, coming to your <laughs> neck of the woods. Um, is it hot up there? Uh, it's actually been nice. Uh, sunny weather, like eight mid eighties. Um, so I wouldn't say it's hot, but it's you know been good, good weather, summer weather. Oh, that's hot, Ty. I don't know. <laughs> mid eighties. What you talking about? Okay. I was I was asking because for the past week I went back to Tennessee to do some follow up data collection, and if you guys remember, you know I have a car down here, but the uh, air conditioner doesn't work. So I've been like really hot all week in this car. And I'm like, whoo, hopefully New York got better weather. <laughs> hot, yeah, hot cars is something different. <laughs> hot cars is crazy. But, you know, I mean, I think sometimes, I guess in New York, it's the city and it's all in the skyscrapers. So there's like a lot of shadows and, mm-hmm. and shade and whatever. So um, as long as it's not like humid, humid in New York is like, yeah, that's disgusting. Yeah, but a little heat don't feel too bad because you got a lot of shade. But yeah, yeah, the subways is a different story though. If you're taking the subways, because I'm, I'm I'm staying in the area, walking everywhere. Yeah. So don't uh uh-uh. <laughs> no, it'd be hot up under there. Yeah, the subways be feeling <laughs> crazy. Like you literally walking into hell. <laughs> 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 but what's going on with um, you? Um, nothing. Same, you know. I mean, I don't have to travel far, but you know, there's all for those of you who don't know, not in our field in a way. There's like uh, every year there's annual conferences. So it's the ASA, which is the American Sociological Association, Triple SP, the, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and then um, the the Black Sociologists, right? Uh huh. Association have, of Black Sociologists. Black Association of Black Sociologists, and they always have. Um, their conferences in the same city every year together. Back to back, yeah. Back to back. Um, so, yeah, so this year's in New York. So you're going to, you know, if you're in the New York area, you're going to see a lot of sociologists running around the streets <laughs> downtown mm-hmm. New York. Um, so, yeah, it's always interesting. So, yeah. So it's fun. Hopefully hoping like they got some sense. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Don't give Looking sociology like a bad name. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but you yeah. never know. Close to all these bars and stuff. Someone like turn up during these conferences, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. I think uh, we got some old Lord news. I think we got a lot to lot to cover this past mm-hmm. few days. <laughs> yeah. Um, so kind of like we've always been doing, uh, lots of news, lots of discussions about what's happening in the world. And yeah, let's get some old Lord news before we get into some more serious news. All right, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say... So on this show, we often talk about the importance of home ownership. If you have not been house hunting, then I'm pretty sure you've seen it on TV. And it's a really exciting time for people to go around to different houses and potentially select one, right? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, well, one couple's open house experience actually led to a white police officer being placed on administrative leave, and it raised questions about a 2009 shooting of a black man in Michigan. Hmm. Interesting. Did you hear about this? Okay. Uh, So what happened is the couple, uh, they were visiting a house that they potentially wanted to buy. And so as they were walking through, they they saw little red flags uh, here and there. So like on the table, they saw like a Confederate flag and they're like, uh, 
Okay, this was a black. Well, this was a uh, interracial couple, black man, a Latino wife. They saw the Confederate flag. They're like, mm, I don't know about that. You know, they saw other little memorabilia around the house. Well, they get into the master bedroom and they actually see an application for the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan oh, in like a framed. I don't know. They framed or something, and they ended up taking a picture of it. And um, that launched an investigation by uh, the the Michigan or I think it was in Grand Rapids, the police force to look into this officer and his involvement with white supremacist organizations. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Just to have the application sitting right there, too. Mm -hmm. And it was out and it looked like an old application. But, you know, it's also weird because the couple was like, you know, I don't know if they were trying to send signals like we don't want uh, black people to buy this house because they had even if he wasn't a part of it and he just liked to collect his white supremacist memorabilia. I don't know. They're sending signals to potential buyers like, OK, your kind might not be welcome here. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it also like the NAACP in the area, you know, it kind of raised concerns for them because in 2009, the officer was actually involved in a the shooting of a black man after a stop. Um, and prosecutors at the time um, cleared the officer of wrongdoing. But now that, you know, for black people in the area in the NAACP, that raises questions about mm, to what extent was that potential killing racially motivated? Yeah, that's true. Because um, if you have the biases and it's apparent, then that means they're going to some they're going to play out in your job. You're not supposed to have that kind of bias or that kind of stuff when you're working, especially as a police officer. Mm -hmm. so I'm mm -hmm. sure some civil case can be presented a strong civil case we shall see but you know that's pretty crazy but yeah they said as soon as they saw that they like ran out of the house they were like uh-uh you're -uh, not gonna <laughs> be up in here no way nah, nah i feel them I do the same thing <laughs> okay so uh speaking of house tours uh i saw this very weird review uh, that a couple left after touring a southern plantation. So, you know, some people visit plantations and tour them like their museums and stuff. You've heard of that? Yeah, I've heard of it. Well, uh, this couple <laughs> decided to visit one and listen to the review. My husband and I were extremely disappointed in this tour. We didn't come to hear a lecture on how white people treated slaves. We came to get this history of a Southern plantation and get a tour of the house and grounds. The tour guide was so radical about slave treatment. We felt like we were being lectured and bashed about slavery. My ancestors were from Sicily, never owned slaves, and my husband's were from Germany, and none of his ever owned slaves. I am by far not a racist or against all Americans having equal rights, but this is my vacation. And now we are crossing all plantations off of our list. It was not just what we expected. I'll go back to Louisiana and see some real plantations that are much more enjoyable to tour. What? <laughs> Yo. <laughs> wow. So that's wild, man. People are, people are silly, man. It's kind of like, what did you, what did you expect a plantation tour to be about? Like, mm -hmm. like, yeah. It was, I don't know what they expected it to be about, but clearly, it shows how some people just don't read, man. <laughs> but it's also weird, like you. It's, it also just goes to show how some people want to like sanitize history. You probably that person mm -hmm. probably wanted to go to a southern plantation tour and drink mint juleps and, you know, think about the experience that potentially the white slave owners had the the glorious side of it. It got mad because they're hearing about like what actually happened. And when people, you know, saw that review, it was tweeted out. They were like, that's like going to like concentration camps and being upset that they're talking about the treatment of Jewish people at concentration camps. Like it's people are just like weird and just insensitive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people just want to, you know, discard or 
put certain elements of history under the rug so that they can feel better about themselves, mm-hmm. um, especially when their ancestors were on not the greatest side of things. Yeah. Um, so it's all, always about this, you know, white comfort. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought that was wild. Yeah. Wild. yeah. I don't know what she thought going to that dang old plantation, man. Like I said, she wanted some uh, tea, sip tea, and, you know, fan herself. Yeah. (laughs) She probably wanted to do some role play and stuff. That's what Mm -hmm. she probably wanted deep Mm -hmm. down. She ain't Mm -hmm. slick. Um, Before we get to more serious, oh, Lord knows, do you have any? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a couple. Um, So let me see. Where do I want to start? Uh, One is I'm sure you've heard of uh, the... (laughs) I don't even want to call her this, but the rapper Iggy Azalea. Yes, I've heard of her. <laughs> uh, anyway, so recently she was uh, in a um, interview, had an interview with Cosmopolitan, the magazine, and in the interview she made headlines because, in she was of course asked about um, cultural appropriation because she, like some other um, folks, have been uh, accused of that. Um, for, you know, really appropriating the culture in a lot of ways. And, you know, pretty much her response was that cultural appropriation is subjective. (laughs) And that um, because, you know, she said her reasoning for that is because, you know, she'll talk to some Black folks about what people feel like is cultural appropriation and people will say, yes, that's offensive. And then she'll talk to other Black folks and they'll say, no, they're not offended. So therefore, she thinks cultural appropriation is subjective um, because within the black community, there are (laughs) differing opinions on the matter as far as what is offensive and what is not. Okay, there might be differences on whether people are offended by cultural appropriation, but cultural appropriation itself is not subjective. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Like that's kind of like uh, we've had discussions about the N word. Clearly, there are some black people who are not offended by it, but it does not erase the fact that it is an offensive racial slur yes. and that you generally should not use it. And if yes. you do, you better make sure it's only around the folks that will give you a pass. Yes, exactly. It's just like it, it, just because some people are offended and not does not mean that it's not cultural appropriation. Cultural pro- appropriation is not defended by if it offends somebody. It's you are actually robbing and stealing somebody's culture without giving the credit, um, which, you know, of course, you know, this white woman from Australia who raps has clearly done in mm-hmm. our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and and um, so she's been exposed for it. But the fact that, again, you 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 people are cr- the community of people are attacking you for this, critiquing you for it, and you're still trying to find loopholes to say that you're not doing it. Um, when, when you just need to do the right thing and say, yes, the root of what I do comes from Black folk and Black culture, and I respect it and I love it. And just that's it. And, you know, but, you know, I guess Iggy will still be Iggy because she just don't get it, man. Yeah, just don't get it. and that's why I don't buy her music. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't really listen to the radio, so you know what I'm saying. When I haven't heard, it, she's not. I she hasn't it. been popping in a long time. When she first came out, she was popping, but you know, ever since you know those videos was coming out, her just saying random things on stage. <laughs> <laughs> The lyric wasn't even lyrics. She was just making sounds. It's like okay. Then she right, also was it. Then Sway also tried to get her to like freestyle one time. Oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> and then, the, and then the caller called in. And it was like, like yo, that ish is whack. Like straight up, like it's trash. <laughs> While she was there on air, oh my god, yeah, there's a viral clip. Go ahead, check that out. If you guys haven't heard of Iggy Azalea, just go check her out. Um, you'll see what we're talking about. She is definitely uh, in the conversation of appropriating uh, black culture and hip hop for sure. Yes, uh, that is a funny video. Check that one out too if you want a good, yeah. <laughs> you want a good laugh. Um, okay, outside of Iggy Azalea, um, another story that has recently come up was um, Joe Biden was on a, uh, he was giving a, um, I guess, a, a you know, a talk, a rally, whatever, in, in Iowa. Um, and the speech was to Hispanic and Asian voters mm-hmm. in Iowa. And as he was talking, he pretty much said this line when he was talking about, you know, trying to talk about poverty and stuff like that. He said, poor kids are just as bright as white kids. Yeah, oh my God, yes. I heard about that. Like, Freudian slip much? Like- <laughs> yeah. 
Oh my gosh, it is all over the headlines. Um, then even if I, I listened to the entire thing and he tried and he said it and then he tried to clean it up. He's like, you know, poor kids are just as bright as white kids. It was his pause. There were like two hand claps. And then he was like, oh, it's like black kids, Spanish kids. He's like starting naming all the races. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I just, uh, I am so worried about him becoming a candidate. I am just because I don't know, like, mm, just oh, no. worry <laughs> because he said so much. And like, even if you can like forgive, like the overlook the things that he's done in the past or said in the past, like he just keep effing up. Yeah. 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 And you know, now this is going to be. Somebody gonna bring this up in the next debate, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. Because there there was already that comment about, you know, I guess that he made in the past about um he, I think he was trying to say that there's nothing inherently better about black kids going to school with like white kids. Like there's nothing inherently, you know, great about white kids that would necessitate black kids having to go to school with them but I don't think it came out like that and I do I did see like a Twitter beef between Kamala's team and Biden's team uh related to that quote but that was like uh, when they were discussing like the busing segregation mm-hmm. stuff a few weeks ago but it's just kind of like that he just gave some people other more ammo because they could use that past quote with this quote and boom there you <laughs> they, go they will they will even though like you said it more likely was a 40 year slip but that shows like it with his inner inner thoughts because thought. i think he meant to say wealthy because that was the theme you know poor kids are just as bright as wealthy kids but he said white kids and then started naming all the races and then said wealthy at the end of that. So, Lord. Uh, <laughs> Lord. and the funny thing, I mean, not the funny way you're saying this in front of a, a, a crowd, voters of color, you know what I'm saying? People of color, is, you're, this is who you're talking to is Asian and Latino coalition pack <laughs> in Iowa. And you are <laughs> saying poor kids are just as bright as white kids. Uh, that is not a good look, Mr. Mm-hmm. Biden. So, We'll see this play out, I'm sure. And um, so I guess my final kind of, you know, I guess it borders serious, non-serious um, issues of, of old Lord news has been um, the NCAA um, mm. has recently come out with a new set of rules as far as which kind of sports agents would be eligible to essentially um, work with, you know, the the college basketball players. Mm-hmm. Um Essentially, these new rules, the requirements are that the individuals must now have a bachelor's degree. They must have been certified by the NBPA for at least three years. Okay, and then they must also pass an in-person exam at the NCAA office in Indianapolis. All of this in order to, you know, represent college students who are looking to go pro. Mm-hmm. And so this there has been a lot of backlash immediately because once this was once this was released, uh, major superstars like LeBron James tweeted out um, that you know the the ridiculousness of this bill, uh, not mm-hmm. this bill, but this policy, and the reason why is because um, LeBron's agent, who is one of his best friends growing up, uh, is name is Rich Paul, and this new set of policies has been known as the Rich Paul rule Mm -hmm. uh, because Rich Paul does not have a college degree and didn't have all these certifications, but is literally one of the top, probably the top um, agent in the NBA right now. I mean, he has people like, um, of course, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. I think he has like John Wall and all these other major names he's been getting and actually giving them getting them where they want to be, like Anthony Davis playing with LeBron James and all these moves, which are traditionally difficult, but he's put the power back in his client's hand to make these crazy moves that we've really never seen before in the NBA. So um, it's coming out to say that, hey, they're creating this new criteria to stop the next Rich Paul from coming up and stealing these agents, um, these students um, from other agents. And, you know, many people have been very vocal about it all over ESPN. They're just calling it hypocritical, racist in a lot of ways uh, because of the criteria, which is which is just silly. No other major sport has these rules. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the NCAA is now making it even more difficult. And the the interesting thing about this and and I'll read this and then um, we talk about a little bit is that the NCAA, you know, released a their statement saying, um, you know, I guess kind of 
change the narrative or why they did this. And they said that um, although some can and have been successful without a college degree, degree as a higher education organization, the NCAA values college education and continues to emphasize the importance of earning a degree. Like, really? Yes. Really? Yes. You have it set up where your players are one and done. They ha- they don't get degrees. All these college basketball players you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You work with the NBA to stop players from going directly from high school when they turn 18 to the NBA because you want them to come and at least play for a year for you to give you money. You don't care if they get degrees or not. Mm-hmm. So you're going to sit here and blow to be put this BS out here. <laughs> like you care about the education. Uh, so it's just bad, bad publicity all around for them. Yeah, I I heard about that. And it's such BS and it seems so targeted. Um, But I was also reading that this might push players to consider non-college, like consider like playing overseas for a year or so, like figuring out other ways to become eligible for the NBA to just completely bypass the NCAA. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, most players who don't want to go to college, go play overseas for a year. And I honestly feel that um, this is going to happen because, you know, the commissioner of the NBA seems to be pretty progressive on a lot of matter manners. And I think there's already been rumblings of the NBA going back to allowing, you know, high schoolers to come play once they turn 18. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think they should just go back to doing that. You're 18. You're an adult. If you're good enough to get to the league, you're good enough to get to the league. And the only reason this makes sense is giving the NCAA uh, of they're doing a favor for them, mm-hmm. you know, so they can get nah get the best player because LeBron never played in the NCAA, you know. Um, so was he, he like was, one of the last ones? He was one of the last ones. Mm-hmm. And look um, how he turned out. Boy, exactly. Yeah, most most players who go straight from the high school, I mean, you have to be really exceptional. You know, most of them don't won't make it to the NBA directly out of, but the ones that do are usually really exceptional players, and that's how it's always been. I think Kobe was one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Garnett was another. You know, there's tons of players. You know, before LeBron that did that consistently and wound up being you know Hall of Famer. So. Uh, yeah, the NBA needs to just go back to that rule of saying you don't got to go to play college. Yeah. Some people are also saying that because of that, because people are going to try to find workarounds, they don't see this rule lasting very long. Oh, no, no. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's really the requirements itself. You're only going to have certain agents. And that's the thing is like it's going to be pretty predominantly white males who are going to have all these credentials. Mm-hmm. Um and this in-house test that you want them to take that you have to pass as well on top of having, you know, the degree and the experience. Then you got to pass the NCAA test. Uh, that's, that's just like, no, you, you guys have a, a mission, you know, a motive to mm. doing this. And the um, money is mo- uh, money is the motive. Mm-hmm, money is the motive. Uh, so, yeah, NCAA, tis tis. You guys got some cleaning up to do, but I don't know. Tired of supporting them. Tired of hearing about them. We need to do something, man. Mm-hmm. Either pay these players or... I figure out a way to give the NCAA a little bit less power. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. So now I guess we can get into some of the more serious old lore news that will lead us into our more serious topics of, of this week. Yes. Yes. Well, um, this first story is uh, so two days after the El Paso shooting, which happened last last weekend or the weekend before last based on when this episode airs um a springfield missouri man decided to walk into a walmart clad in body armor carrying tactical weapons and packing 100 rounds of ammunition now he reportedly grabbed a shopping cart when he came in and began filming himself walking through the store um You know, the manager of the store saw him, decided to pull the emergency like fire alarm to get everyone out of the building. But the guy seemed to police said the guy did it to cause chaos. Yeah, that'll do it, Um, especially in this current time where everybody's worried about everything and uh, now they're just doing it for show uh, to worry folks. You know, it's getting ridiculous. Even I know. Have you seen the video of just like. Um, people in Times Square were running. Um, no. You see that video? Uh-uh. So uh, there was like, it was it was like kind of an early evening starting to get dark out. And um, and uh, a guy's motorcycle had like, you know, backfire, like 
make that loud noise, like boom, 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 boom. And then people assumed that there was gunshots. And so it was just like mad people just started, you know, Times Square is like the heart of downtown New York, where it's tons of tourists, tons of everybody. Everybody just started running uh, in mass and like, some people got hurt, you know, because they were getting like trampled and knocked over and all this kind of stuff. Um, but that's just like the fear now that people are living in just every day, which is a motorcycle backfiring. Uh, but people thought it was gunshots and they were taken off. Um, so some really scary times that we live in, man. Yeah. Because of this mass shooting. And it's crazy that people want to provoke people. It made me think about when we lived in Lafayette and people like have started walking around with those, you know, assault rifles. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I saw them. Yeah. It's just like, why do that? Why? Yeah. Because they're trying to prove a point before what? Uh, This gun stuff is crazy. This Mm -hmm. gun stuff is crazy. Uh, But speaking of Walmart, uh, (laughs) oh, my God. So in response to these mass shootings, Walmart decided to take action. They decided that they wanted to pull violent video games from the display in response to the mass shootings. However, they will continue to display actual guns as well as sell them. It, it, it just don't make no sense. Man. <laughs> like, it's just so dumb. It's just like, you're going to, first off, legitimize this rhetoric of Donald Trump blaming video games for these mass shootings, where, again, we already, you know, when I talk about the research, our research shown there's no uh, legitimate connection between the two. So you're going to pull away or, or not advertise violent video games that has no connection, but actually continue to sell the product that is actually causing these mass murders. It's just all about image. And and at the end of the day, it's, it's just complete hypocrisy. Like you said, I just don't like that they're trying to legitimize this BS message. You know, none of these people said that violent video games had anything to do with it. They were quoting Donald Trump. They were... Mm-hmm. outlining his name in guns. Did you see that picture? Yep, I saw the picture. You know and I'm saying? Like, let's not pretend. And he said, the, the shooter from El Paso said he was, he in his uh, affidavit that was, was released said that he was targeting Hispanics, t- targeting Mexicans intentionally. That was his intent. So now you're like spinning this narrative around like, it's video games where these culprits are not saying anything about video games whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, but other companies um, I said companies other countries have had a reaction to these mass shootings did you hear that Venezuela and Uruguay actually released warnings to their citizens about to come that- to the US. Yes. first of all Venezuela doing it I think it was just like come on <laughs> <laughs> y'all, are, y'all are really trolling us <laughs> They are definitely trolling us, which I can't blame them for. Um, but, you know, I think it's it's serious, though. You know, it's serious. If you are, you know, trying to come to this country or visit, um, it is a worry, especially if you're someone that is of Hispanic or Latino descent coming into this environment, visiting particular states. You are a target uh, to these mm-hmm. white supremacists. So I can see, you know, why they would do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just it's just interesting that, you know, we think about like, oh, my goodness, you know, should we go to the Dominican Republic? Should we go here because of what's going on? And now people are starting to look at us that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as they should, because I, like I said, we have our own citizens running when they hear a muffler going off of a motorcycle, which means we're living in that same fear. So what you gonna expect people coming from different countries, what kind of, you know, tension and, and situation they're going to feel when they're coming here, you know, mm-hmm. the same kind of stuff mm-hmm. uh, or even more so because they don't even know the areas or know the people as much. So yeah, it could be even more an- anxiety inducing. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, talk about this gun topic for a little bit because it is imp- important and, you know, it's clearly been a hot topic for the saddest of reasons these past few weeks. Um, now, one of the things that Mitch McConnell, you know, has actually, you know, I think all this pressure now is actually saying that they're going to address 
um, some gun issues and gun control. Um, now, he did say that he's not going to call an emergency meeting. <laughs> but when, um, you know, the Senate and Congress or whatever reconvene in September, that uh, gun control initiatives and discussions will be, you know, a priority on uh, the discussion table. Um, and pretty much his thing is that he is saying that uh, background checks will probably seem to be prioritized in any kind of discussions of reform, serious discussions of reform is the background check conversation. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. You know, and, and we talked about it on the episode for those of you, you know, I mean, we'll talk about some things here, but we have an entire episode. We talk about gun control and go through a bunch of research and data. Uh, but the, they keep spinning this narrative. You know, I think a quote, who's this quote from? Um, I don't even oh the, the, well, this is from Pre- President Trump saying guns should not be placed in the hands of mentally ill or deranged people. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, trying to use that narrative. It's using that narrative and saying that has to do with mental illness and all this other kind of stuff, which is just not the case. And it's like even when we talk about background checks it doesn't matter because these people would still pass the background checks. Mm -hmm. The way it's set up is that you have to be institutionalized in order for you even to be red flagged, Mm -hmm. right? You have to actually be in a a mental health facility and then it will come up. So even if you're just going to a therapist, you know, for whatever reason, that's not going to be red flagged. Um, And most of these people are not going to therapists or or going to any kind of mental institution. So they still would, uh, you know, pass these tests. So it's like background checks are not going to stop this from getting into the hands and it's just like already um st- re-stigmatizing or adding further stigma to this already stigmatized population of people who are mentally ill mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i saw this me they were joking and it was you know meant to be like tongue in cheek but somebody mm-hmm. tweeted how about we treat men who buy a gun like women seeking an abortion a 72 hour wait period, mandatory video about mass shootings, travel hundreds of miles at own expense to only buy guns at like one shop at a, uh, within a particular state. Them having to walk through protesters in order to get the gun. It's kind of like it is easier to get a gun in some states than it is to have a legal abortion which could be you know related to like rape incest anything yeah it is a gun access um that's been a lot of the you know conversations um we're talking about what actually works with gun um gun control and all these studies are are showing that you know it's not about just background checks and stuff like that it's literally access to guns well, you have a higher rate of gun violence. Um, mm-hmm. And so that needs to be one of the first things that needs to be addressed. And there's also been this um, article in the study that's been resurfacing quite a bit. I think you actually, I'm not sure, did you repost this? Or maybe one of us reposted it on Facebook. Uh, but it has to do with the um, the connection between gun policy preferences and, mm-hmm. and racial resentment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the study came out in political behaviors called racial resentment and whites gun policy preferences in contemporary America came out in political behavior in 2015 of November um, and oh, by Alexandra Philandra. And pretty much, you know, the Vox has an article on the stuff that came out shortly after this was coming out. But what she found was that people, white folks have an attachment um, to, you know, uh, not or are less likely to get gun have to li- or less likely to ban guns um, are also more likely to have racial resentment. Right. So mm-hmm. there's like this connection between how you feel about your race being superior and also uh, having access to guns. And in this, she makes this connection that there is a connection of, you know, uh, racial like white superiority to owning guns in this mm-hmm. country that she's been finding. And one of the interesting things is that because the way she did her, you know, I'm not going to get to the full details of it, but. You know, and this this has me thinking about studies as well that I look at from this point on is that a lot of data and polls, how they use the questions or try to look at like uh, racism or or things of like racial bias and, and, and prejudices are probably not the most accurate because of the times we live in now mm-hmm. and how most people are not going to be honest when they see those questions or questions that trigger those kind of you know, sentiments or emotions out of people like racism. Um, And so she was looking at things like racial 
um, resentment and stuff like that because it's kind of the newer, more subtle way racism plays out. Mm -hmm. And using and developing measures that focus on that, you get to see it more clearly than looking at like the traditional or more explicit I guess, measures of like, are you racist or not? Or do you have prejudice or whatever it can be um, playing off of that? She also used the implicit bias, implicit assessment tool from that's at Harvard that a lot of people use in this study as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to show like this connection, that even though we've been saying things about white supremacy, you know, research is, all, research is also supporting that attachment to guns is a uh, attribute of white supremacy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, like you said, I'm happy that we're coming up with new measures because people are savvy now. People know how to answer questions. People know how to mask and disguise these feelings. And so we have to have we have to be just as savvy as them. Yeah, we do. And, and when I think about it and when I was looking at that study, I'm like, you know, because, you know, there's an article in Vox where they interview her and, and you know, she you can read it and, and she talks about her research more casually. And, um, you know, one of the main things she says is that, you know, white identity, you know, guns are attached to this like white identity or assert white identity. And you know how there are certain things in a culture that historically you are connected with when you think about just just white folks and how they've always used guns to to dominate Right. Mm-hmm. Even coming to America with the native populations and all this other kind of stuff. Um, it's always just been a part of their, uh, you know, superiority complex in a lot of ways and their identity. And so it makes sense that, yes, this is going to be a strong attachment to them, because even in an article, she raised the question because most people of color who are more likely to be victimized um, by gun violence, they not they're not they're still they still want more ban more uh, gun control bans and laws and stuff like that mm-hmm. because if you look at the ideology of like the people like NRA and stuff it's like oh well you know you need guns to protect yourself or these communities who are most victimized should want more guns to protect themselves for the guns that are being used on them but yet those who are being most victimized are saying like no we want less guns on the street because we see what happens. Um, so those narratives are, are still don't, don't even line up and they're competing as far as what's actually happening and what people are believing it to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I actually read that um, black people are starting to become more open to like owning guns, especially in the wake of these mass shootings. I'll have to look at the, you know, I guess, credibility of those polls. But um, it's something that I did recently see. Yeah, there, there was like, um, a, I think it was like a spinoff. It wasn't like the NRA, but it was like kind of like a, a black NRA, if you will, where they're, they have been developing more chapters because they've been getting more interest and mm-hmm. buy-in throughout the, the country and the various different states. Um, and yeah, and, and I mean, one of the reasons that uh, I think, you know, because, you know, they was asked these questions of why. And one of the biggest reasons that black folks are owning guns is to <laughs> protect themselves because it is racial climate now um, is one of the major driving factors to protect them and them families for, you know, uh, these white supremacists in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. it is happening. But yeah. Yeah. No. Um, another major thing that is going to be up uh for i guess debate or is going to be like a major uh political issue i guess when congress gets back in session as well as when we vote in 2020 is immigration and so in addition to the mass shootings there was a mass raid this past week in mississippi did you hear about that Mm -hmm. yeah and uh it was sad so I'm pretty sure you heard about it, but for those of you who did not hear, um, the Mississippi raid swept up almost 700 workers from six different food uh, manufacturing plants. Um, Of those detained, uh, 342 were from like Coke Foods um, and PH Foods facilities. 252 were from uh, Pico plants. And 86 were from Pearl River Foods. There was a seventh plant, but for whatever reason, there were no workers present at that plant. I don't know if they got tipped off or something Probably. like that. Uh, but yeah, it would be weird for a plant to just not have any workers there during yeah. the day. Yeah. Uh, but nearly 700 workers. And 
you know, beyond just the number of workers that got swept up, people were really kind of outraged about this story because they did it during the workday while people's children were at school. Mm -hmm. And these children were getting on the bus, going back home to no parents. Uh, Although some, you know, districts or school heard about it and were, you know, able to keep the kids in or at least make sure that um, they were turned to some adult at home. There was at least one school district uh, that had to bring the children back to the school and have them spend the night. Well, yeah, you know, that's this whole situation, like, again, uh, it's getting ridiculous, um, you know. The, the videos, it's the one viral video of the young girl pleading, you know, mm -hmm. um, for this to stop and 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 because her parents are taken away. And it's just like one, they're not fully even thinking this all the way through. Right. You're going to raid all these people. Now you're going to have all these kids that are separated and distraught and traumatized. Um, and now what about their well-being? And then, you know, I'm sure they're rounding up people who are actually citizens as well. And you, there's no way you're getting 700 people that are not citizens. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's just like, this is ridiculous, man, what this, this administration is allowing these people to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think for me, when I read some of the quotes from, like, ICE officials, I was really disgusted. So, you know, when they were kind of questioned about their tactics uh, related to, you know, at least not tipping off the school district so that they could, you know, make sure these children uh, were safe. They said, we are a law enforcement agency, not a social service agency. Um, and then they went on to say that they could not notify schools because it could have botched the operation. Mm. Uh, there was another quote uh, when they were talking about this to say where they said, we are not a humanitarian agency. Pretty much like we don't give a damn. Oh, man, this is uh, this is scary, man. The, the way Trump is using, like, again, militarizing this branch, like ICE. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I know we've been talking about this this past few podcasts, but this, this the, the reality of, like, this kind of the patterns of genocide, man, it's like, this is what he is really doing, you mm -hmm. know? Like, you don't think they didn't do this when we talk about, you know, Holocaust and all this other kind of stuff? You, didn't, you, you don't think Hitler was out here taking his military arm and going and raiding Jewish communities? And rounding people up and putting them in the camps, like look at what we're witnessing right now mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and and it just sucks because it's like when we talk about places like Germany <clears throat> and and what the Nazis were doing, there were a lot of like their citizens who were being complacent or complicit in this, you know, and not fighting back. We're just watching this dictator do all this. And it's like, damn, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if we look back in the history books and this is the time period we're living in, like, what can we say we did to stop this atrocities from happening and stop from stop Trump from doing this ridiculous stuff, man? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's wild. And beyond that is kind of like these workers are here because someone is offering them employment. And for me, it's kind of like, why arrest them and not arrest and find the, find the companies and the executives that are welcoming? So, and, and so this was in Mississippi. These are red states. And I think what is firing me up is because, you know, my research is about, you know, how immigration is, you know, shaped in schools in the South. And what is has been so amazing about my research is that like these executives, they'll be conservative. They'll have this rhetoric. They'll say all of these things, but their actions don't align with what they're saying. They're just doing it to rile up these people to be anti-immigration, but they aren't even anti-immigration themselves. Even Trump, you know, has had, you know, undocumented workers and, and things of that nature. So it's like, it bothers me that conservative executives are funding campaigns that build on this anti-immigrant rhetoric, but at the same time, they are capitalizing and exploiting the labor of these people without any type of uh, backlash. 
And so it was just kind of like, if we should be arresting anybody, arrest them, not the people who were literally welcomed here yeah. for yeah, these I mean, jobs. It's, 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 you, I mean, you're 100% right. And that's cool. every time, every briefly when I talk about immigration to my students, it's always a question I pose because everybody always likes to debate whether or not people should be here illegally, undocumented, whatever, and if they have a right to do so. But I'm like, somebody's hiring them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody is not is ignoring their paperwork, right? Mm-hmm. If our country is so against these individuals, and if you really want to stop, then go after the people who are, um, you know, hiring them or not reporting it, whatever it is, right? Shouldn't that be a crime? Shouldn't that be, shouldn't they be held accountable for those actions, just like you said? But we overlook them, you know, those bosses or whoever owns these these uh, food places are going to still be there and trying to hire people the next day to, to keep it running. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what's crazy is so... Um, For our listeners, I do qualitative ethnographic research, and we have these things called informants. They are people who provide us with information um, and resources and et cetera related to our research topic. So one of my informants actually told me that these companies will send buses to the border. And for the people that make it over, they're driving them right up to these factories. Not only that, they are helping them secure housing. They are working with local landlords. And that's why you might see like over like a few years, you might see certain areas just transform like. And certain places just become hubs for new immigrant, you know, populations. And it is done by design. So it's just kind of like. I don't know. People are just so clueless about this. But part of the reason that they were able to have this big raid is that uh, over the last 10 years, uh, they have been uh, so like, for instance, sometimes when uh, undocumented people come over or, you know, maybe they're arrested or detained. Sometimes they will put like, I guess, ankle bracelets or tracking monitors on them and It seems that the federal government was using these tracking monitors to figure out like where these large populations of people were or where they were going. Mm. That's crazy, man. Like I said, this is all this is all becoming too much. And I don't know. One first thing first, we got to get this guy Trump out of here. Mm -hmm. He's tearing this country apart. Mm hmm. And families apart and, and people are dying, um, you know, because uh, the sad story to talk about has to do, you know, has to do with this. Uh, there was this kind of video that went viral of a man from Michigan who was deported by ICE in June. Mm-hmm. Um, his name was Jimmy Aldoad. I know. Uh, no, Aldoad. Aldoad. Jimmy Aldoad. Uh, he was deported in, in June back to Iraq. Um, Jimmy was here. He came here legally in the States, I think it was 19, 1970, sometime 1979, when he was one years old, right? Mm. Um, pretty much this is all he knew. Lived in America his entire life, was deported back to uh, Iraq. He put out a video that went viral with him just talking about his situation. I mean, in the video, you can see he looks, you know, exhausted. Um, he just looks like he's been having a rough time out there. He pretty much said that he was homeless. Um, he knows he didn't know anything about that place, had no family out there, was just by himself. Um, what made it sad, though, is that he also was um, diabetic, and mm-hmm. he couldn't get to any insulin as well, you know, couldn't health care, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then a few, uh, I think a few days ago, he was found um, dead in Iraq um, mm. a few days after this video was put out. Uh, and so, you know, this has been making a lot of headlines. They've been like interviewing his family and all this kind of stuff saying like, you know, this is the impact of what ICE is doing, what these deportations are doing, these aggressive deportations without being careful and looking at people's situations and adding Mm -hmm. context. You put somebody who's been here, he was 41, so he's been into, he'd been here for 40 years. This is all he knew. This is his home, America. Mm -hmm. Now you threw him into Iraq. And And now he's dead because of that. And I also read that they, you know, in addition to like his diabetes, which was a health concern, that it was not appropriate to send him to Iraq because he's actually Catholic. Mm. And I believe uh, 
people of the Catholic faith, they have faced like issues, uh, like with religious persecution. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I read that. So to me, like in addition to the diabetes situation, it didn't seem appropriate given like, that would be enough for somebody to, you know, seek asylum that if for their, you know, religious background, they don't necessarily fit in a particular country, you know, it, it, it didn't seem appropriate to send him back there. Yeah. And, and, and the reason some of the rationale they use is because, uh, you know, he had a, a, a criminal record. Right. Um, they said that he had at least 15 uh, criminal charges over the past 20 years. Um, and, and some was including assault, breaking, entry, resisting arrest, disorderly conduct and home invasion. Uh, but they talked to his brother. I mean, one. So that's what you see on surface. But again, this is about providing context. Um, he was he, he diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And so many of the incidences that happened was between him and his father in the home where he would. And this is before he was being diagnosed. His brother said a lot of these charges came up because he would have an episode. He would wrestle and tussle with his dad, um, break some things in the house. And his dad couldn't calm down. And he would call the police, you know, and the police would get involved. And then he was having criminal records. I think another time, like with uh, larceny, something like that, he like broke into one of the family members' cars and like just stole a cup holders or something like that. So all the incidences was, was with, with his family, with his parents or with one of his siblings or whatever, while he was battling this mental illness. Um, so again, they're just using these charges to be like, oh, he's a criminal, he's a bad person, uh, but yet he was dealing with a mental illness that you know the family was wrestling with. And sometimes where there's not a lot of services available, people are going to use the police to help you know, calm down the situation and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just, it's a, you know, it's just a sad story all around. Uh, and, and this is, you know, the result of what's going on uh, in this country. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, recognizing, yes, the privilege that I have of being an American citizen and, and not being, um, I guess, as fearful as some other folks who might have family or parents or themselves be, you know, have paperwork, visas, my, is it overstayed, is it not? Do I have my paperwork on me? It's a legitimate concern nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't know when, you know, ICE will be coming your way or if some, some hiccup will happen and now they're trying to send you to a country that you've never been to like that. I can, I, like, you know, I, I know one part of my, um, looking at my, uh, I think it was one of my, family reunions, whatever, you know, um, on my dad's side. So I, I know like part of my African ancestry is from like Zimbabwe. Okay. So it, so it's just like, what if I just had to get pick up and go to Zimbabwe? Like I have no idea of what I'm going to, what I'm walking into. Like, I just can't even imagine being in that kind of situation, you know? To uh, where you don't know anyone and you're forced anybody. to try to make a life for yourself in a country you've never been to. It's, I can't even, I wouldn't even. I and you were even forced know. to do it. It's not like you voluntarily migrated because you wanted to. I can voluntarily, my, I'm forced to go back to this country that I know nothing about, know nothing about the land. I can't come back here at all. Um, and that's like, unless with some paperwork. I mean, that's just, that's just like ridiculous. I can't even imagine no. what, what I would do in that situation. This is what people are going through now on the daily here in this country. Mm -hmm. It's It's crazy because. Uh, I was part of this academic Facebook group and somebody actually, you know, asks, like, do you think a social security card is enough to prove, you know, citizenship? And they were particularly they were talking about their child who is part uh, Latino, but looks like presentation wise, you know, I guess looks fully um, l Latino or I don't know what it means to look Latino because you can look black and Latino. So I, I, that didn't make it. Sense. But you, you get what I'm not saying. Not what you're saying. It's though. brown. Yeah, not, like white, not white presenting at least. Yeah. Not white presenting, not black presenting Latino, but, you know, the brown uh -huh. uh, presenting yeah. Latino. Don't don't get uh -huh. me, people. Don't don't <laughs> come after me. But you y'all know what I was saying. But, uh, you know, this person was asking, you know, do you think a Social Security card is enough? And like seeing people actually say, like, I've been carrying my birth certificate around or I've been doing it. It's crazy. It's wild just to be having that on your persons at all time just because you never know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's like to me, it seems like to the for the most part, the ice, it really don't even matter, you know. It's like they still just rounding up whoever, 
Uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm sure there's cases, but it, I, I couldn't even say with extreme certainty that if you show them the paperwork that they'd be like, oh, OK, continue on your day. I just don't believe that. <laughs> well, we know they didn't because of that uh, 17 year old boy in Dallas who was detained for three weeks. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he had a Texas state ID, which you cannot get that ID unless you are a citizen and you've presented paperwork to the Department of Motor Vehicles. They did not care and they still detained him. So, hey. Ah, uh, man. And it's like, what's crazy about this is that as most people have already discussed are saying that the biggest issue immigration isn't people crossing the border illegally is people um, st- overstaying their visas. Mm-hmm. But it's like, they're only attacking uh, brown folk, you know, mm-hmm. brown immigrants. I am sure there are a ton of white immigrants who are here <laughs> who have overstayed visas, mm-hmm. you know, from all these countries. But I feel like they're, they're not getting as, you know, exposed or alienated as much as, you know, especially the Latino population. Um, so I don't know. And I, and I got to start looking. I got I to gotta look into this. So I want to know who that like, what are the qualifications to work at ICE? I got to see this kind of stuff. I just feel like it is like a becoming like this militarized branch of the government that's like white supremacy. I mean, you can already, so we already know that sometimes when it comes to these, and they're calling themselves a law enforcement agency, when it comes to certain law enforcement, you know, entities, it doesn't take much. You got a high school diploma, they aren't testing these people for mental illness, you know, they're just giving these people free reign to like detain people. Like they're becoming like a second police force almost. Yeah, they are like that. That's their job is to look for immigrants, and it's like they're racially profiling. Man, it's like it's all bad. Yeah, I think I think ICE needs to be like disbanded or like their role needs to be drastically diminished. At least the enforcement part. Yeah, I feel like they need to be more like uh, I don't know, like take away like the the policing aspect of it like you can't arrest folk you can't detain you know, you, them. yeah you can interview you can follow paper trails you know you can question whatever but you can't you can't detain them like because that's getting ridiculous yeah especially randomly like if there's an investigation yeah you can come pick up folk but like just like randomly following you know people around i, I just think it's too much and you know mm-hmm. what's crazy the the crazy thought i just had this is probably one instance I can think of where potentially being black is a privilege, because even if you are a black immigrant, there's this perception that you just a regular old black American. Like, uh, and there's there are people who are doing research on like undocumented uh, like African and Caribbean immigrants. So I know that they're here, but when it comes to like these crazy random stop and detains, this is one instance we don't have to worry about ICE. Maybe we got to worry about the police, but maybe not ICE. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, just another person of the police. <laughs> we see a regular police officer that we, you know, we we get nervous more than an average person. But yeah, but I feel like yeah, both equally for for these people who are Latino descent, people who are immigrants. Um, it's just a scary time to be living in right now. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, not only do I feel bad for, you know, the people who are getting taken away, but these kids just watching these videos, it's like, come on, they're kids. They're going to school, and now they come home from school, and their parents are gone. Mm-hmm. Like, you know how traumatized that is for a 10-year-old, for a 6-year-old, you know, yeah, even a teenager, even, a, even an adult. You know, if I just – my parents are just taken away all of a sudden. They talk about they're in some kind of detention center. You know, I'm not going to handle that well, you know, <laughs> even as an adult. So I just like, this is like, I don't know. But, you know, I do believe in karma. I just do believe that somehow these rights, these wrongs will be righted. Um, you know, this administration will somehow, you know, something's going to happen. I don't know. I'm not saying anything bad, but this, this has got to be corrected. Either there's going to be some extreme mobilization with the people somebody's going to take something too far where it's just going to be enough is enough. Uh, and you know, there's going to be, we got to fight back. We got to do something. I wish people thought more about their legacies because 30 years from now, when we're writing history books, 
you're there are so many people that are going to be bad guys just because they didn't step up just because they didn't say nothing they didn't do anything and they had the power like there are so many bad guys that are making history right now for the wrong reasons Mm -hmm. and i wish people like even if you didn't care about the people because i mean there are certain people you just cannot force them to care i wish they cared enough about their own legacy and how they will be portrayed in history books as just anti-human just evil yeah evil. yeah because yeah. you're gonna have your, your your kids your grandkids are gonna look back and say yo grandpa grandma what were you doing yeah when this guy trump was in office doing these things i'm learning about in history class yeah it, you ain't even gonna get no statue erected and if we do we're gonna be knocking them over just like we oh, did yeah. on confederate <laughs> statues like yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to be there whatever night that is with my black mask. <laughs> Haven't knocked that thing right over to. I'll be right with you. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, this is this is wild. Um and you know, we're gonna keep our eyes on it and we're gonna keep, you know, sending hopefully positive energies and figuring out ways to be active to to stop this nonsense from happening. Um there was a post going around of I can't remember who it was either like a senator or somebody major, maybe the governor, somebody in Mississippi that, you know, everybody's like calling. Uh, they're sending a number around to call the office and, you know, um, express your, yeah. uh, uh, your, your, dis- your displeasure with what's going on currently and what they did to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, so, so well, I think we, we need can to find it and link there. it. Yeah. Yeah. Link it up and then we can all be a part of that. Do our little part. Um, anything else? No, I, I think that's it. That's kind of heavy. Hopefully, yeah. um, I will say that it will probably one thing we should probably try to do is have another uh, immigration scholar on just to contextualize some of this a yeah. little bit more, even to, just to talk about the impact that this is having on children. Um, I just read an article that uh, Latino children are like more depressed Mm -hmm. as this anti-immigrant rhetoric uh, ramps up, as these deportations ramp up. And like I said, even in my own interviews, you have teenagers who the is weighing heavy on them that like they could come home and their parents aren't there and they're in this world alone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we. if anybody knows anybody, definitely shoot it our way. Um, we definitely want to reach out and get um, a, a scholar on here to talk about these things because, yeah, that, that'd be a really good episode because it's timely and we need it. Um, and one last thing. I know, have you seen this um, this list of business, businesses that have been going around that have been? Uh, yeah, yes. And you know what? I'm like... So I, I do at face value believe it, but also like I've, I've been wondering where the source because I saw a tweet, I didn't see a source. Yeah, yeah. So the guy, he, um, I saw the tweet and then I clicked on the thread and then he actually provided links to where he was getting this information from because people were asking, and pretty much this list. I'll read the name of some of the businesses in a second, but so some of the list, many of the businesses and companies. It's not like a direct linkage to the Trump. It's like they're f- giving funds to or donating stuff to certain organizations that those organizations are then also supporting Trump as well. Oh, okay. Um, so I think I think one or two might have direct, but m- most of them have like this kind of like mediating factor, if you will. Uh, yeah. Um, but so some of the the companies that have been listed, like and these are mainly fast food chains, like In and Out Burger. Chick Fil A, mm-hmm. Taco Bell, McDonald's, Wendy's, KFC, Pizza Hut, Olive Garden, Waffle House, IHOP, and Carl's Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people, a lot of funny tweets have been going around. People are like, "Oh, listen, if you see me losing weight, you know this is why." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw uh, that, and I was like, "I'm gonna make some tough." choices because if i can boycott kanye west i can get healthy and boycott some fast food too so you know yeah yeah I, trump might actually be helping make the country a little healthier you know oh <laughs> 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 uh, man but yeah i mean those just to throw that out there we can pro- provide a link for that too <clears throat> just look at the list and you guys can check it out for yourselves but these are these are names you know i think that at least 
to say the least, it'll put these companies on people's radar to be like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, where where your money really going? Is there connections? Are you doing any funny business? And I'm sure now they're probably going to move more carefully too, because mm-hmm. I don't think anybody wants to be associated with this guy right now. But oh, I'm sure some people do. But you know, yeah, it's, not it's always it. some. It's always somebody. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Oh uh, man, but all right. Um, uh, it's been a good episode. So you know, uh, if you haven't yet, follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast is our handle. You can also visit our website, blackandhighlydangerous dot com, to keep up with all our latest content. You can also email us with any ideas, any content ideas, questions. If you know, say it, good immigration scholar or somebody who has expertise in that area, send it our way. Email us at bhdpodcast at gmail.com. Um, then you can go on iTunes and please review and rate the podcast. That always helps us out a lot. And then after you do that, share the podcast with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.